Hello from ChemHelp ASAP. In this video, we'll talk about the general workflow that many experiments follow. When synthetic organic chemists talk about performing a reaction, they frequently compare organic synthesis to cooking. There is even a popular chemistry blog called Just Like Cooking. So before we talk about how we perform a reaction, let's review how you might approach something more familiar, like cooking in the kitchen. So maybe not everyone, but lots of people, when they, when they cook, they first read the ingredients list. You want to make sure you have everything on hand to go through the entire recipe. You then read the procedure. Do you have all the equipment you need? Do you have a two-quart saucepan? Do you have a deep fryer? Is everything that you need clean? If you are missing something, do you have something else that will work just as well? Looking at the procedure ahead of time lets you know what is coming. For example, lots of baking recipes have a first step of preheat the oven so that the oven will be ready once all the ingredients are mixed. Personally, I'm a very slow cook. I ignore the first step and leave the oven cold until I'm ready, and I probably won't be ready for a while. You can choose to deviate from the procedure, but you need to understand the recipe well enough to understand the consequences of any changes. Chemists performing a lab experiment follow very much these same steps. Do we have all the chemicals? On hand, is all the required glassware and equipment, like stir plates, available? As a student, you can probably trust that all the materials will be provided by your instructor. Regardless, making sure that your needed glassware is clean and dry before you start is very helpful. You don't want to be ready to do a suction filtration and realize that your Buchner funnel is filthy and needs to be cleaned. Similarly, you might find that some chemicals in the lab are kept in different places. Which chemicals are over by the balance? Which ones are in a fume hood? Where is the waste collected for the experiment? Have an expectation in your mind of what will happen in the experiment before you start. Of course, not everything can be predicted ahead of time, so some flexibility is necessary in your expectations. Okay, that's the general connection between cooking and doing a synthetic lab. They both require following a procedure and do actually make something. Early preparation steps are very similar. Let's not kid ourselves, however. Cooking and doing chemistry are not exactly the same. A big difference between cooking and performing a chemical reaction is safety. So do not forget safety. A kitchen can be a dangerous place, but a chemistry lab has a higher level of risk. For that reason, you wear safety glasses in a chemistry lab, but not a kitchen. Loose clothing and long hair are restrained. Appropriate clothing is worn, for example, closed-toed shoes. You might wear gloves when working with certain reagents. Maybe you need the additional protection of goggles, not just safety glasses. Volatile reagents will be handled in a fume hood. Unstable reagents may call for the use of a blast shield in front of a reaction. There are all kinds of additional precautions that may be required, but I want to focus on just a few more common safety risks. On the screen are the most common risks in a teaching lab based on my experience. They are listed in order of what I worry about. Number one is eye protection. If you lose an eye in lab, it will not grow back. Damaging an eye can be irreversible and life-altering. Furthermore, reagents that can burn your eyes include acids and bases. And acids and bases are commonly encountered in undergraduate labs. So wear your safety glasses, wear them properly, and be careful with acids and bases. In addition to burning eyes, acids and bases can burn skin and put holes in clothes. I don't want to be too glib about acid burns on skin, but major acid spills and exposure in a teaching lab are rare. In general, minor burns on the skin may be painful, but skin grows back. Clothing can be replaced. That's not true with an eye, so wear safety glasses. Furthermore, know where the eye wash station is. If someone gets something in their eye, help them to the eye wash. Gently shove their head into the water jets and let the fountains flow. It will certainly make a mess. 
but that's a small price to pay for maybe keeping someone's eyesight. Number two would be burns from hot items like hot plates and heated glassware. Hot items in lab often, often look the same as cold items, so it's easy to grab something that is surprisingly hot and even dangerously hot. Undergraduate organic lab experiments do not often require extreme heating, but it's certainly possible to get a nasty burn while boiling ethanol or water. Just be careful. Even a folded paper towel can be used as a makeshift pot holder for quick handling of hot glassware. Skin burns from hot items are more common than acid and base burns to the eyes, but I worry about acid and base risks more because of the potential da damage to one's eyes. Heat burns are painful, but skin grows back. Number three, and it's a distant number three, is fire risk. Organic labs have organic solvents, and many organic solvents are volatile and flammable, even explosively flammable. However, since open flames are generally restricted in organic labs, fire risks are low. Some organic reagents can generate sparks and initiate fires, but you don't see these often in teaching labs. Regardless, it's not a bad idea to look around a lab and know A, your nearest exit, and B, your nearest fire extinguisher's location. Some labs have fire blankets, and in case someone's clothing catches fire, you want to use something like a fire blanket. Know what safety equipment is on, on hand. I will not explicitly talk about safety for the rest of the video, but safety should always be on your mind as you work in a laboratory. Let's talk about the steps that are common to very many lab experiments. We'll spend a lot of time on this slide. Number one is taking inventory. This is what we talked about at the start. Confirm you have everything you need to run the experiment. Familiarize yourself with the procedure. Have an idea what the next steps are. Lots of students do a lab by reading a step, doing that step, and then reading the next step. Look beyond the next step. Number two, setting up the reaction. This step involves getting your apparatus ready. Note that the word apparatus sounds fancy, but your apparatus may be as simple as a beaker with a stir bar. Look ahead in the procedure. If you need a water or ice bath, have those ready. Get your hot plate warming if that's called for. If you take exceptional measures for your setup, like you have an exotic glassware setup, make note of your efforts in your lab notebook. Number three is adding the reagents. Follow the procedure carefully. Order of addition. is often important. So add reagents in the order they are listed in the procedure. Students often form lines when getting reagents, and it can be tempting to add reagents out of order in order to avoid waiting in line. It's fine to get the reagents out of order, but do not add them to reaction out of, your reaction out of order. Record what you do in your notebook. Always note visual changes. Did the reagent dissolve? Did it not dissolve? Did it cause a color change? These are key observations. One final comment about reagents, be sure to record what you used in your notebook. If the pr procedure says to use one gram of reagent, but you used 1.05 grams, your notebook should record what you actually used. 1.05 grams. Step number four, you then run the reaction. You let the reaction do its thing according to the procedure. But do keep an eye on your reaction. If the reaction needs to stir for 30 minutes, then don't disappear for 30 minutes. Every five or 10 minutes, check on the reaction. Is it still stirring? Has the appearance changed? If the reaction needs to be in an ice bath, make sure the bath still has ice for the entire reaction time. Record your actions and observations in your notebook. Just like you periodically check on food when it's cooking, you should check on a reaction. Number five, monitor the reaction. Some reactions tell you that they are done. Maybe there's a key color change or a precipitate forms. Other reactions will not visibly change. The, proce the procedure might recommend a reaction time, but does that really mean the reaction is complete? 
In cooking, just because brownies bake for 15 minutes doesn't mean they are done. You stick a toothpick in them to check them. You can actually do the exact same thing in a reaction. One of the most common techniques for checking a reaction is not to poke it with a toothpick, but to take a TLC of the reaction mixture. By TLC, you can check for the disappearance of starting material. Once the starting material is gone, the reaction is likely complete. Not all reactions need to be monitored, but it's very common. You can't always assume that a reaction is finished once a certain amount of time has elapsed. 6. Workup and Isolation Once a reaction is complete, one needs to get the product out of the reaction. This is the product isolation. The isolated product is technically a crude product. Going from the reaction mixture to the isolated crude product may be as simple as filtering the reaction, the reaction product from the mixture. This only happens if the product has precipitated from the reaction. When the isolation is not so simple, chemists will refer to a workup procedure. A workup can involve multiple steps. Reactive reagents may need to be neutralized or quenched. Solvents may need to be removed. Very often, a liquid-liquid extraction may be required to separate the nonpolar organic product from the polar side products and salts. Note that the term workup can be a noun. I am going to do a workup on a reaction. Or as a verb, I just worked up this reaction. The workup process takes the reaction from its reaction mixture state to a crude, isolated product. Next is purification. Isolation generates a crude product. Crude sounds bad, but crude only means that the product has not been purified. Sometimes crude products can be quite pure. A, a clean crude. It happens, especially when the product is isolated by filtration from the reaction mixture. So not all reactions require a purification. Crude products, however, are often not very clean and do require purification. There are three main purifications. Distillation, recrystallization, and column chromatography. Which method you use depends on the properties of the product and the impurities being remo removed. Purifications are often more difficult, even much more difficult and time consuming than running the reaction. Still, purifications are frequently unavoidable. The last step is characterization. Once a product is clean enough, it will need to be characterized. During characterization, data are collected on a molecule to reasonably confirm its structure. So this is structure confirmation. Data may include NMR spectra, melting points, TLC, mass spectrometry, etc. If a molecule has never been made before, then proper characterization will require more data collection. If you've made a molecule several times, then you might just need to get a proton NMR of the product to make sure everything looks okay. Characterization data should be gathered and filed in a manner that makes it accessible. It could be a physical or electronic copy. Part of organizing information requires a good naming system. Molecules are often named based on the page number of a lab, a lab notebook. Calling a product white solid with brown specks is not a proper filing system as you start performing dozens and hundreds of different reactions. Okay, those are the common steps that you go through when you run a synthetic organic experiment. Every experiment is different, but these general steps represent a typical process. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a better understanding of what happens during a synthetic reaction. Please subscribe, like, or leave a comment. Take care.